You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Okay, it's a little bit past 9.30, so let's go ahead and get started. I'll pray, and uh, then I'll start into the Q&A. I have a list of questions here that I wanted to go through this morning, so let's bow our heads. Lord, we're very grateful that you give us this technology and that we can even be together, even if it's at a distance, we can at least be together in in spirit and one in purpose, and we can gather together and enjoy your word together and our fellowship, and we're just so grateful that you have called us into your body, the church, and it's our desire that in this time this morning, in both this Sunday school hour, with Q&A and with our, our time in your word that is to follow, we pray that you would be glorified through all that is said and done to our our fellowship together through our spirit and our demeanor. Pray that you would give us wisdom and clarity and understanding your word and thinking through uh, challenging topics um, that we may, our hearts may be aligned with you and conformed to you and that you would do the work of sanctifying us by and through your word. And I do ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so I had a few Q&A or a few questions that I wanted to go over that were left over from last week. One of them, uh, first a clarification, because I made, somebody asked me what fiction books that I enjoy, and uh, I mentioned that I don't read fiction, and then I got home, and my entire family corrected me with a list of fiction books that I read, like Animal Farm, I've read that a number of times, I've I've read that to my children a number of times, The Screwtape Letters, I have read and reread those, Chronicles of Narnia, I've read all of those books to my children at least once, and of course, Pat McManus, um, growing up in North Idaho, you got to read Pat McManus. If it were up to me, reading Pat McManus would be required reading to be a church member, but that's not up to me. So I do read those fictions. Those are the only fiction books that I, I really, well, I shouldn't say those are the only ones. Those I've read and to my family, um, but those are read to my family. Those are ones that I read to my kids. So I do read, did have read fiction books to my kids, um, but it's not something that I pick up because I necessarily enjoy it and read a lot of fiction. So, all right. First question from, uh, this is actually submitted. I was supposed to try to tackle this last week, but I didn't get around to it. And it is from uh, the book of Isaiah chapter 65. And Lanny asked this question from the description of the new heavens and the new earth in Isaiah 65. It sounds as if there's going to be death in heaven. And I'm going to read the passage to you. It's Isaiah 65 verse 17. It's 17 through the end of the chapter. And you will, as you listen here, you'll, you'll hear Isaiah describe the Lord creating new heavens and new earth, which we associate with heaven. And then it seems as if that description contains, um, mention of death and childhood and procreation in the new heavens and the new earth. So it's a little bit confusing. Isaiah 65 verse 17. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. For the young will die at the age of 100. And the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people, and my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The dust will be the serpent's food." They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. So there you have, and then chapter 6 talks about God's throne in heaven, or heaven being God's throne. So there in that extended passage, you see that Isaiah, looking forward to the future, describes the new heavens and the new earth. And then he speaks of procreation or children dying um, at the at the age of 100, or pe- old age, people living to old age. So there seems to be uh, aging and death and procreation in what Isaiah describes as the new heavens and the new earth. So there's two ways of viewing this, and I'm, of course, going to be answering this from a premillennialist perspective. There's two ways of viewing Isaiah chapter 65 that I think would answer this in terms of this apparent dilemma here. 
The first would be to understand that as Isaiah is looking forward into the future, and we see this often in prophecy, Isaiah is seeing the end times, something yet future to us, and he is looking and he is seeing aspects of two things that are covered in the book of Revelation, the millennial kingdom in Revelation 20 and the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. From Isaiah's perspective, being 700 years BC, so 2,700 years ago, from Isaiah's perspective, what he saw in the future vision, he, he saw all of these events together as if they were part of the next age, which we would consider the millennial kingdom as well as the new heavens and new earth. That would be, from a premillennial perspective, the age to come. So it's not like the millennial kingdom is part of this age. That is part of the age to come. So Isaiah, looking forward, saw the age that is to come. And in that, he saw elements of both the millennial kingdom, which would have procreation as well as death in it, and as well as uh, children being born, etc., and people aging. That would be aspects of the millennial kingdom here on earth uh, found in Revelation chapter 20. Isaiah would have seen aspects of that or elements of that, as well as elements of the new heavens and the new earth. So he would say, the Lord says, I create a new heavens and new earth. He would be seeing the establishment of heaven or the creation of heaven, which is after the millennial kingdom. And then he would also see as part of that age to come, which which involves both the, the new heavens and the new earth, the, the recreation or the regeneration of all of creation. He would have seen that as well as the elements of the millennial kingdom, and he would have seen them together. So from Isaiah's perspective, it's what we call mountain peaks of prophecy, where an Old Testament prophet would look forward in time. He would see different events that belonged to a period of time, but he wouldn't necessarily see the distance or the all of the events that are incorporated with that. So that, I think, is the easiest or the best explanation of it. The other way, and this is sort of a, a different premillennial perspective, is to say that the creation of the new heavens and the new earth in Isaiah chapter 65 is a reference to the beginning of the millennial kingdom. And so in the book of Revelation, we see the creation of the new heavens and the new earth being a reference to um, to heaven, to the final heaven, after the millennial kingdom. But in Isaiah, he could use that exact same phrase to describe the establishment of a renewed creation, but not a regenerated creation, not a resurrected creation that will be part of heaven. He would see that new heavens and the new earth is a reference to the establishment at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, which will which will involve a lifting and a mitigation of the effects of the curse, as well as the binding of Satan for a thousand years and the utter prosperity and almost Edenic-like qualities of the messianic kingdom that is to come. So Isaiah could describe that as the new heavens and the new earth and be speaking of some sort of a reformation or a a recreation or a renewal of creation by the lifting of the curse under which everything groans now, he could be looking forward in time and seeing that as the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth. So that new heavens and new earth is a phrase that could be used to describe both heaven, as it is in Revelation 21, as well as the beginning or the renewal of creation, the lifting of the curse that begins the messianic reign in uh, Revelation chapter 20. Either one of those would be a good way of, a, a, a way of which the new heavens and new earth, that phrase could um, describe. That makes sense. Does that make sense? I'm turning to our live studio audience, which we have uh, in, in studio here with us this morning. All right. Uh, second question is, what podcast do you listen to? This is kind of a personal one, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some of the podcasts that I listen to and which ones that I would recommend. Uh, these are in alphabetical order because I'm pulling these right out of my own podcast player. Uh, I listen to STR Ask, hashtag STR Ask with Greg Kokel from Stand Reason Ministries. It's about a 20-minute show that incorporates some short answers to short apologetics questions. Alpha and Omega Ministries with James White, The Dividing Line. I listen to that. Uh, there's another one called American Conservative University, which is sort of a political uh, political show, but it incorporates uh, – it's run by a Mormon guy, so I don't listen to any of the Sunday stuff. But some of the political uh, – it, it kind of collates – like the Dennis Prager show, uh, um, who are other guys, Michael Medved and some guys like that, and gets little clippets from some of their stuff, which is always kind of fascinating. It's kind of an eclectic blend. The Art of Manliness is another one that I listen to. I enjoy that. It's a lot of interviews with uh, different people from, from different walks of life, uh, some psychologists, some Navy SEALs and military veterans, and it's kind of uh, just sort of a manly man's man type of a podcast. I enjoy that. Not everything that I listen to is religious or sermons, obviously, because I have a very eclectic blend of educational interests that I like to kind of stay apprised, apprised of. I listen to the Ben Shapiro show. I listen to the Christian Worldview radio program with uh, David Wheaton. 
And that's a very good one. He deals with a lot of cultural relevant stuff from a, a Christian worldview perspective. There's an economics podcast that I listen to called Contra Krugman that talks about economics, uh, basically answering uh, Paul Krugman's uh, New York Times column every week. Of course, I listen to Crossroads Bible Church, which is Tim Carr's uh, ministry. I listen to his sermons, enjoy those. The Dan Bongino Show is a is a political uh, political commentary uh, podcast I listen to. Uh, the Expositor with Stephen Lawson from One Passion Ministries. He talks about issues and and elements related to expository ministry and pos- expository teaching and preaching, and it's kind of a preachers oriented podcast, and I enjoy that one. Uh, Freakonomics is kind of an economics podcast, and I listen to some of those things, not all of their episodes. Some subjects interest me, others do not necessarily. The Grace to You Pulpit podcast, which is uh, John MacArthur's weekly sermon, I listen to that, as well as the Great Life Pulpit, which is Steve, uh, no, not Steve Lawson, uh, Phil Johnson, his uh, Sunday school class, uh, Phil Johnson and Mike Riccardi, their Sunday school class at uh, Grace Community Church, the Grace Life Pulpit is an excellent one. And now I see that I see that uh, Peter is trying to keep links to all of these in the feed, which is good. Uh, see if you can keep up, Peter. Listening in from um, World Magazine, that's kind of a good one. Some of those interviews are really interesting. Some of them not. The Matt Walsh Show is another political one. Motley Fool Money is about investing. Uh, Stand to Reason Weekly Podcast, that's two hours a week of apologetics, question and answer, and interactions with Greg Kokel. I've enjoyed that for years. Uh, I don't listen to all of every episode of this, but the Steve Day Show is uh, another political podcast. Thinking Out Loud with Alan Schleeman is an apologetics podcast. The Tom Woods Show is um, a libertarian podcast. I don't, uh, I don't necessarily agree with every libertarian perspective on every issue, but it is sort of outside of my normal uh, political box to listen to different subjects from people from all over the spectrum. Some guys I really agree with, some guys that I wouldn't. Um, the Verdict with Ted Cruz is a new one, which I kind of enjoy that one. It's about 20 minutes a week. The Way I Heard It with Mike Rowe is kind of a, a Paul Harvey kind of a podcast where it, he tells a story about somebody or something that uh, happened and and uh, kind of keeps the identity of that person secret to the very end. It's very engaging, and I enjoy that. The World and Everything in It, which is World Magazine's podcast. It's a 30 minutes a day of news um, uh, of news commentary and, and uh, news reports. And then Wretched Radio with Todd Friel is an hour a day. I enjoy that as well. Um, other ones I listen to, How I Built This with Guy Raz. Sometimes I read that or listen to that. Sometimes not. Uh, it kind of depends. So some of those are, you might be thinking, how do you listen to all of that? Which I saw one question come up. How do you how do you have time for all of that? I listen to most of my podcast at two and a half speed. I skip through a lot of the commercials. I have it set up to cut out the intros and cut out the exits of my podcasts. And I enjoy listening. I'm kind of behind about two, three weeks behind in my podcast now, but I listen to them while I'm, while I'm walking, while I'm riding my bike, while I'm mowing the lawn, while I'm in my garden, while I'm driving around, uh, while I'm doing mindless stuff here at the church, cleaning up my office or, or something like that. So I have, I have lots of time. I try and fill it with, try and fill it with that stuff. Shouldn't say I have lots of time. I have, um, I have lots of all my spare time, I should say, I try and fill with listening to something, taking in some kind of information that will be a benefit to me. Somebody asked a question, how much coffee do you drink in a day? Apparently that's connected to the number of podcasts that I listen to. Four or five cups of coffee. It's not much. Somebody asked about the the sign hanging over my shoulder. This is what it says. That's going to be, that's going to be uh, backwards, I guess. It says, wacky books I have to read for a writing project. So these are all of the books like Surprised by the Voice of God by Jack Deere. Um, He Speaks to Me by Priscilla Shire. How to Listen to the Voice of God by Charles Stanley. Um, All of that theological sewage that I had to read in order for my new writing project. I put all of those on a shelf and I put this sign up. Wacky books that I have to read for a writing project. Uh, right below it, because what happened is we were having some trouble with internet service, and the plug-in for my data wire was right below that shelf, and one of the technicians was here, and he walked into my office, and he was taking that apart, and right in front of his face were all of those books, and uh, I saw him look up and kind of glance at him, and I was horrified, and I had to point out to him, those are not good books, those are ones that I'm I'm reading for a writing project, and so then I just wanted to make sure that those books were labeled as not something that is kind of right by my arm that I can that I use as references, but books instead that are theological sewage that I have to, I have to plow through in order to uh, write a book. 
So I have them marked for that reason. If I die, I don't want people walking into my office and thinking those are my, those are my go-to resources right next to my desk. Um, all right. I kind of teased this last week and I want to deal with the subject is, is it always wrong to lie? Somebody said it's backwards for you and correct for us. Oh, okay. Yes, those books are in quarantine. <laughs> My wife doesn't like me drinking coffee during the podcast, so every time I do that, that's for you, sweetie. Okay, is it always wrong to lie? This is a tough question, and one that Christian moral philosophers are a little bit divided over, and there's kind of a broad spectrum of approaches to this. I want to lay out two of them and then kind of tell you what I think the moral reasoning is behind the position that I would take. There is the, either the answer to that question is either yes or no, for one. It's either always wrong to lie, in which case, um, even if you lie for a good purpose, like to save somebody's life, uh, that would be considered a moral sin, or it's not always wrong to lie, in which case then there is a, there is a moral reasoning behind, uh, situations and circumstances in which, uh, it is, it is not a sin to lie because the, what you say with your mouth to is used to deceive people for a good end. So on the one hand, John MacArthur would say that it is always wrong to lie in every circumstance, that Rahab was wrong, um, that even if you were to, to lie in order to save somebody's life, that, um, that that would be sin in itself and that you would have to tell the truth in that, that, that uh, situation and leave the results to God. I think that that would be John MacArthur's perspective on that. On the other side of the moral equation are people who would say there are circumstances and situations in which it is not only just morally justified to deceive somebody with your words, but that it is morally obligatory to deceive somebody with your words. On that side of the spectrum would be Greg Kokel of Standaries and Ministries. He wrote the book um, Relativism, Relativism, Feet Firmly Planted in Midair. He wrote that with uh, Francis Beckwith. So Here's the moral equation or the moral logic behind somebody who would say that, and sometimes it is justified that you uh, you can lie in certain situations. The go-to example is always the Nazis come to the door and you're hiding Jews in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, and the Gestapo asks you, "Do you have any Jews in your home?" And you are you're confronted with the the opportunity to say either yes, we are hiding Jews here, or no, we are not hiding Jews here. And that's kind of always the the moral dilemma. You're faced with two moral morally two conflicting moral standards or ethical requirements. One to tell the truth, and the other one to do what you can to preserve life. Those are the two moral dilemmas that are kind of at odds there in that situation. Before I answer that, before we answer that uh, question or that situation specifically, let's back up for a moment and ask the question. Is it always a moral sin to deceive somebody? Is it always a moral sin to deceive somebody? Or are there situations in which deception is morally justified? Is all deception wrong? And it's not my perspective that all deception is wrong. And I'll give you a few examples of that. When you play a football game, you are, you are required to deceive the defense. If you don't really deceive the defense in making them think you're going to run when you really are going to pass or that you're going to pass when you're really going to run, you're going to lose the game. The whole craft of, of a sporting event is to deceive the other team into thinking you're going to do something that you're not going to do and to trick them into not expecting what you're going to do. There are games that are, that are intended where you use deception, whether you're playing a card game or a board game. There are games that are all set up around deceiving or tricking other people and trying to gain an advantage in, in a certain way. The, I would argue that those are not morally compromised or sinful activities to engage in those. I would also argue that it is not it is not sin to leave the lights on at your home, to communicate that somebody is home when they're not. That's an act of deception. You're deceiving potential would-be thieves by making them think that you're home or by even installing things in your lighting system or in your house that would turn the lights on at a certain time, turn them off at a certain time to give the appearance that you're home when you're actually not home. That would be an act of deception. And so not all deception is is sinful. And I think that everybody on both sides of the more on both sides of this moral argument would agree that not all deception is wrong. There are times when deception is wrong, when you intend to do somebody harm or you descend to trick somebody into doing harm to themselves or whether you are trying to gain an advantage for yourself. For instance, it is wrong to deceive the IRS. It is wrong to deceive your spouse. 
it is wrong to to deceive in, in certain situations where um, obviously the deception is akin to lying and you're doing harm to another individual. Is it wrong to deceive somebody in order to preserve or protect life? And this is where we get back now to the illustration with the Nazis at the door. Some people would say, even those who would say that it is sinful to, it is always sinful to lie. Some people would say that in the situation where the Nazis come to your door, you would be, you, you would be free to, to give a half truth, to present the truth in such a way as to deceive, because you're trying to preserve life. It would be all right to give part of the truth or to even withhold some of the truth in order to trick the Nazis at the door. So for instance, I, I think it was, uh, it was Corey Tamboom who, who says that one time when the, when the Nazis did this, she said, well, the Jews are under the table. And of course, the Nazis laughed at that and they eventually left. Well, it's true that the Jews were under the table. They were under the floorboards under the table. And so her statement was technically true, but it was not accurate in the sense that it actually communicated a true thing. It was intended to deceive them by tricking them into thinking that she was joking when in fact she was technically telling them the truth. So she used the truth in that sense to really trick them or to deceive them. So is it always wrong to deceive somebody, even if you use your mouth to do so? Um, and I, my position is that it is not wrong to always do that. Now, some people would say you can deceive somebody or trick them or withhold truth or do part of the truth or, or uh, trick them into believing something as long as you don't utter an untruth with your mouth. And for me, but if, but, but if you say the untruth with your mouth in order to deceive somebody for a good end, then that's lying and that's sinful. That is, that is the equivalent of saying that it is, it is okay to use every resource at your disposal. Your, your property, your possessions, the way you say things, how you communicate the truth, even giving untruths, giving partial truth, withholding truth. You can do everything in your power to trick or deceive somebody into thinking that something is true as long as you don't say it with your mouth. It's the uttering of it with the mouth, the falsehood, that then makes that deception immoral or wrong. And I would say that if it is not sinful to deceive somebody into thinking that something is true, by using every other resource that you have. Why is it sinful to deceive somebody into thinking that something is true by using your mouth to do so? If you're able to use every other resource that you have to deceive somebody, why is using your mouth all of a sudden make it wrong to do that? So in the event of the Nazis at the door, I don't think it would be wrong to lie to them in order to preserve life because in a sinful world where we have two conflicting moral obligations, you look at those two conflicting moral obligations and you have a moral responsibility to do the greater good in that situation, which would be to preserve life rather than tell the truth. Telling the truth might end up in somebody dying, in which case you have a responsibility to do everything you can to deceive that individual in order to preserve the life. And in that event, deception and lying in that case is not morally wrong. Now, Wayne Grudem in his book, Christian Ethics, he says uh, in there that God, because God has promised to never lead us into temptation and to never put us in a place where there's no way of escape, that God will never put his people into a situation where we are confronted with two conflicting moral uh, obligations. God will never put us into a situation where we are forced, where we have to lie or where we're forced to sin. I guess that'd be a better way of describing his position. God will never put us in a situation where we have two choices and we will sin and do either one. I would agree with that. Now, Wayne Grudem would say that God will never put us into a situation where you have to either either preserve life or lie. And he would say, or, or sorry, cost somebody the life by telling the truth or lie and preserve life. And either one of those would be sin. God will never put a Christian in a position where they have to choose between those two options. And I would agree that God never puts us in a position where we are forced to sin. But my position is that when you are placed in a position where you are you can deceive somebody into thinking that something is true and preserve life, that that act of deception, even if it involves the use of your lips, is not itself sin. Not only, you're not, you're not required, you're not sinning in that sense because you are doing something to preserve life. Now, some people would say, well, that's a pragmatic argument that you do evil that good may come of it. No, a pra but, but in my position, that's not evil to lie in that situation. It's not any more evil than it is to tell a half-truth in that situation or to use some other way of deceiving people or communicating an untruth. This is, this is it. We, we are allowed supposedly to use every resource at our disposal to communicate an untruth for the sake of doing good as long as we don't communicate it with our mouth. 
And see, that I think is not consistent. If really the violation of the commandment to not, thou shalt not lie, just like thou shalt not commit adultery and thou shalt not murder, has to, it, it involves the attitude of the heart, the disposition of the heart, and the motive behind it. If, if, if it is the motive and the thoughts and the intentions that also violates that commandment, then speaking an untruth to deceive is just as much a violation of that commandment as, as, or sorry, in, in, in do, using every other resource at your disposal to deceive is just then as much a violation of that commandment, thou shalt not lie, as speaking the untruth. So, yeah, that, that I think is the best answer to that. I, I don't, I don't believe that the bearing of false witness against your neighbor is the same thing as using your words to deceive in order to accomplish a good end in that situation. And I'm talking about that extreme moral situation. So if you think that, okay, Pastor Jim, he's condoning lying in any, every situation. Uh, no, that's not what I'm saying. Question of God condones lying. How can he be trusted? How can he be trusted? God's not condoning lying. God does condone it is okay to deceive people. That, that I think is, is fine. There was a, the, um, just as when God gives instructions to the children of Israel to come up to the, the gate of Ai and then flee away in order to draw people out, that was a military tactic that deceived them into thinking that they were being defeated when there was an ambush in store for them. That was an act of deception. So that was an act of deception that God instructed the children of Israel to do in order to deceive them into thinking something was true that was not. So, is it sinful then for a police officer who is pursuing a child predator to go into a chat room and pretend to be a little 13-year-old girl in order to catch child predators? That is a lie. It's an act of deception. Is it immoral or wrong for a police officer to do that? In the situation, I don't think it is. What about a police officer who's undercover to bust child sex traffickers? He has to pretend that things are true that are not. He has to deceive people. He has to even lie in those situations in order to catch a child predator. Is that itself morally wrong? So that doesn't mean that necessarily every lie recorded in scripture is justified. So Abraham lying about Sarah intended to protect her. That's not necessarily to say that every moral sin or every act of lying in scripture is justified. It is to say that in certain situations, the, the act of deception is the deception itself morally wrong and sinful. If, dece if deceiving somebody is not sinful, which if it is, then we do this all the time uh, in day-to-day -day life. Um, because we leave the lights on at home or um, we do other things to communicate certain things are true about us in our situations when they're not actually true. If that act of deception is sinful, if it's the exact same thing as lying, then then I guess then all, all if, if every every act of deception is lying, then yeah, every lying would be wrong. All lying would be wrong. But if deception, but I'm but I'm I'm differentiating between the act of deceiving somebody using your words and using every other resource at your disposal. So is, was Abraham just in lying about Sarah? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, was Abraham was, what was the other one? There was another question. Oh, David and Jonathan, they lied to Saul when they devised the plan to test whether Saul was going to kill David or not by uh, David and Jonathan saying, well, we, let's tell Saul that you requested to go celebrate the feast in Bethlehem. And uh, well, then we'll find out if he is angry and intends to kill you or not. And that did indeed involve protecting David as well as exposing Saul's sin. So in that situation, was David and, was were David and justified David and Jonathan justified in deceiving Saul in that way? And that I think is something that would need to be determined a little bit by the historical context. Judging from what they did there, I think that there was it was obvious that Saul intended to kill David. So I don't think that that was the only way to preserve David's life at that moment. So I would say that that sin probably was not justified, or that that deception was not justified in that situation. So that's a tough one. Those are two sides of the moral equation. Uh, is it always lying? To, is it always sin to lie or to deceive somebody with your mouth? Um, it is if it's always a sin to deceive someone in every single situation ever. That I think is the moral. That I think is the moral logic. If we're going to make the case that it is always sin to trick somebody into thinking that something is true when it's not, that is a form of lying. That is a form of, of deception. If we're going to make the case that all of that, every instance of that is sinful, that I think is the case that needs to be made in order to say that every act of communicating an untruth with your mouth is also sinful. 
I think that that's a package deal. If we're going to differentiate between tricking and deceiving somebody for a good purpose, then I think that there's a form of deceiving people with your mouth that would fall into that category that it is morally justified at times when the op the only other option that you have is the death of somebody. If somebody broke into my house and said, is your wife at home? I'm going to rape her and murder her. Am I morally justified to say, yeah, she's upstairs in the, in the bedroom? Or would I be morally justified to, to lie to that individual, to tell them an untruth in order to divert them or to delay them or to deceive them or to in some other way protect my wife and kids? So I think that, uh, yeah, that's it. That's it for that one. I think I've exhausted that one for all I can. And I see that there is just page after page of comments in here, but I'll have to go back and and uh, look at some of those a little later on. And by the way, I'm not saying that Scripture doesn't say anything about false witnesses and lying. Obviously, lying is a sin. There are certain situations where, there are most situations, most situations, the vast majority of situations in which when we bear false witness, it is a sin. And I'm not talking about every situation. I'm not saying it's justified to lie in everything. Uh, nobody would make that case. Nobody on that side of that moral philosophy is making the case that there's no such thing as the sin of lying. That's not the point that they're making. So if you hear me saying that in, in this little narrow situation where we have a conflict of moral duties and we have one that is lesser and one that is greater, if we choose the greater and violate the lesser, that that, for ju therefore, that therefore justifies the violation of the lesser in every other circumstance. That's not the case I'm making. And if you think that that's the case I'm making, then you haven't heard anything that I've said up to this point, because I'm not talking about the vast majority of those of those activities or those actions. So um, here's the next question. Is a Christian supposed to follow the law to a T to the best of his ability? This is a this is a, a difficult question to ask because it's too, too broadly or generally stated. I think that we have to we have to ask, what do we mean when we talk about obeying the law to a T? What part of the law are we talking about? Because there are certain circumstances where I'd say, no, we don't have to obey the law to a T to the best of our ability because there are elements of the law that involve ceremonial, uh, ceremonial responsibilities the children of Israel had, like not wearing mixed fabrics, what I would be violating right now with this wonderful shirt, um, sowing mixed seed in a field, eating cheeseburgers and shellfish and elements of the Mosaic Code for visiting or the elements of the law for visiting the land of Israel three times a year during certain feasts and the observ observance of the feasts and the sacrifices and the offerings. All of that was part of the law. So when we say, is a Christian required to keep the law to a T the best that he can? The answer to that is no, um, because the term law is too broad. Are we required to obey the moral law of God to the best of our ability? And I think the answer to that question is yes. And this involves would be involved in the Ten Commandments and all the moral qualities of the law. But those elements that we are to obey of the Old Testament law are also part of the law of Christ. So in the New Testament, it talks about us obeying the law of Christ. And that the, the law of Christ is written on our hearts and God's law is written on our hearts. So now we as Christians obey the moral elements of the law. Uh, as a delight and as a joy and and not something that we do because we are under the condemnation of the Old Testament law. So the moral elements of the law about lying and stealing and adultery and fornication and homosexuality and all those moral elements of the law, yes, we are required to obey those, but those are now the law written on our hearts, which we do out of joyful obedience to the Lord. We obey them because the New Testament says that we, these are to be the moral standards of the Christian. You go to uh, Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 5 that talks about putting to death the deeds of the body and living under the power of the Spirit and and uh, living in holy and, and humility and righteousness and gentleness, etc. Those are all moral qualities that the law would have pointed to, but we are not obeying the Old Testament law when we live moral and godly and righteous lives. We're obeying the law of Christ. We're living under the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's a yes and a no question there. All right, um, where does the soul come from? Is it created or does it come from our parents? Uh, Dave Rich emailed this one in. I, I think that there's a mystery regarding how individual souls are created. I do not think that, yeah. He was meaning civil law. What's that? The question was civil law. Oh, the question was civil law. Okay, not, Peter. Not mosaic law. Peter just came in and, and asked, uh, the question was civil law. So by, by, but again, we're talking about a law that was given to the nation of Israel under a theocracy that was to be ruled by God. So 
the civil law, are you talking about the civil elements of the law, like we should be stoning homosexuals and children who are disobedient to their parents and idolaters, etc.? Um, I don't think that we're under that because we're not Israel, and that law was given to the nation of Israel. There are elements of that law which are indicative of what a righteous government would look like and how a righteous government would respond, but we don't live under a theocracy, and we don't live under that civil theocratic system. So therefore, we are not obligated to go out and find idolaters and drag them into the church and stone them. And I think that that distinction is clearly seen even in Paul's in Paul's way of handling idolaters and homosexuals and fornicators, etc., in the church. The answer that's given in 1 Corinthians is church discipline and not stoning. So I don't think that we as Gentiles living under the new covenant are obligated to follow to the best of our ability the civil law that was given to the nation of Israel. I think that fails to make the distinction between uh, God's people as a church and God's people in the theocratic nation of Israel. I hope that helps. Um, Idaho law. Current civil law. Today's laws. Oh, sorry. another clarification. Correct. Idaho law. Uh, I think that we are required to obey the law and we are required to obey government uh, until they ask us or demand that we do something um, that we do something that violates God's clearly God's word. So yes, I do. We do. We should obey the laws to the best of our ability, and to not do so is a sin because we do live under that civil government. So yeah, that's. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. When you said law, I was thinking Old Testament. Thanks, Chumgito. Appreciate it. All right, and then uh, where does the soul come from? I think that there's a bit of mystery in this one, and this will be the last question that I take. If I have some time left over, I'll scroll through the comments and see if I can answer some of the other things. But the um, there's there's some mystery as to how the soul is created and where its origin comes from. God is the creator of every soul, but does he do that through the conception, at the moment of conception? Is it something that happens that God has has worked into the natural world so that the joining of egg and sperm actually creates a soul, or does God himself create a soul at that moment individually apart from the act of conception and implant that soul or or attach that soul to that embryo. That that's something of a mystery that is there, whether that's part of the natural order of create of procreation or whether it is each soul is a unique and divine act of God. There's a part of me that says that it 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 is something that happens under the oversight of God at the moment of, of conception because if it doesn't, then you would have to explain how it is that God creates a sinful soul because it is in sin that our mother conceives us. It's in sin that we are we are born. And so if God is creating that sinful soul himself as a direct act, then then that would be the that would be sort of the problem with, with that view. I think that the other the problem with the other view is that if if husband and wife are creating and there is a soul there that is part of that um entity as a as a part of the egg and the sperm coming together at the moment of conception if that's when the soul is created as an act by the father and the mother then you don't have something that's created by god you have something that is created in nature um and it seems as if the human soul is something that's unique and and specifically designed and created by god um, with each, each individual conception so I, I i don't know that i can answer that question of who creates a soul um, the man and woman or god directly uh, I think that there are pluses and minuses to both of those views. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.